Hello. So thank you, everyone, for coming. This is our first um, CP Imperial talk. And um, the CP Imperial campaign has actually been running for three years now. And um, Prof. Morel was has been supporting us for um, all those three years. So thank you, thank you very much, Prof. Morel. Uh, so Prof. Morel is professor of physiology uh, at the um, Sleep and Respiratory um, Center. So uh, let's begin. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thanks, everyone, on for coming. What is actually a very lovely evening. I, so I think you could have been having gin and tonics or something on the terrace. It's been so beautiful. So um, Sleep Imperial started a couple of years ago, and it's completely and entirely student-driven initiative. So they book the talks, they advertise it all, they're responsible for setting up the yoga and the meditation sessions. And it was really developed by the SU campaigns team to raise awareness of sleep at Imperial. And I think they've done a brilliant job. And the fact that you're all here to listen about sleep, um, I think, shows that. So my job, because I'm the first speaker of the whole week, is to give you an overview of a little bit more information about what sleep is. Some of you I recognize in the audience should know some of this information, but you're probably quite safe I won't pick on you. Um, but um, I'm gonna give you a overview of what sleep is, and then I'm gonna indulge myself by talking to you about some of the key mechanisms that I think are relevant in terms of sleep research at the moment and tell you a little bit about some of the research of our group, and we'll definitely done before seven. So that's what we're going to do. And so just so we're all on the page, same page and that we're clear about what we're talking about, the important thing about sleep is that um, it's done laying down, it's done in a relaxed posture, you are unresponsive to stimuli. So that's the one thing that kind of defines sleep, if you like, is that you're not responsive to sound or um, uh, various stimuli. But unlike some of the other states around unconsciousness, it's reversible. So it's really important that we understand what sleep is. It's that suspension of consciousness that is reversible. And I think, personally, some of you will have heard me say this, I think it's remarkable that it's reversible. Because I think it's really amazing that we go to bed every night and we just expect to wake up. You don't go to bed and think, I wonder if I'm going to wake up in the morning. You sort of expect that you're going to wake up. And I assume you expect that you're going to wake up because you've woken up every other morning. So your brain knows that if it suspends the consciousness, it will wake up. But we don't really know very much about that process of why you wake up. So it is remarkable that your brain can go to sleep, but it's kind of even more remarkable that you wake up. So we're going to talk about um, what sleep is, how you can measure it, what it's for, and then a little bit about what happens when it goes wrong. So for those of you that have not um, really thought very much about sleep, and because we're probably most of us scientific in the room, I thought I'd introduce you to this image, which um, if I take the lights down a little bit, there you go. So you can have a little snooze while you're looking at it. This is a representation of sleep done by um, an artist, Stephen Appleby, who does a lot of um, cartoon designing for The Guardian. And he was really asking the question, what is sleep? So he created this kind of mind map, if you like, of what he thought sleep was. And for me, it really encompasses or articulates one of the big problems that we've got about sleep is that it's really difficult to describe what it is and to measure it and to quantify it. So we, people have tried in different ways of quantifying it. And um, what we do um, mostly clinically is we put electrodes on people's heads like this dapper young gentleman is here. And you can see the electrodes on his head here that will be recording his brain activity. 
But the brain activity that we record has to go through the scalp. So the electrical activity of the neurons in the brain is relatively low amplitude at the surface of the scalp because it's got to go through all the way through the skull. And you can do EEG on all sorts of different animals. Here's one, a horse having its sleep measured. And so people have realized that this way of measuring sleep is probably a little bit imprecise, as is the previous slide that I showed you of the artistic representation. So people have started to try and be more sophisticated about them, how they measure sleep. And they've started trying to do MRI scans to try and look at what happens to the neural activity when you go to sleep. Has anybody had an MRI scan? Have you been in an MRI? It's a bit like putting your head in a dustbin and somebody beating on the side of it. It's not really conducive to sleep. For those of you that have had one, did you fall asleep in the scanner? Uh, nearly one. Yeah. I fell asleep in the scanner when I was supposed to be having my muscle activity measured because I'd been on a night duty before, but that's the only time. So you, you can, but it's difficult. So one of the things I want you to take away from this lecture is that our ability to measure sleep or our inability to measure sleep probably has made a big difference to how far we've got with the discipline. And if we can find good ways of measuring sleep, we'll probably move forward as a field much quicker. So this is where we've got to at the moment in terms of how we describe sleep. So we sleep on a 90-minute cycle. All of us sleep on about a 90-minute cycle. So what happens when you go to bed tonight is that hopefully you'll fall asleep fairly quickly, probably within about 5, 10 minutes, although it might take a bit longer tonight because you'll be thinking about your neural activity. So what happens is that you start off awake over here and then you go very quickly down into what we call deep sleep. And you'll see some numbers here, and it says one, two, three, and four. They're just stages of sleep. And when you get down into stage four, you're in that nice, deep, restful sleep that makes you feel better in the morning. And then you stay there for most of the first 90 minutes until you wake up again um, after about 90 minutes. And you have a brief period of sleep, which is called rapid eye movement sleep. Who's heard of REM sleep? Yeah, most people have. Why have you heard of REM sleep? Why do you think you've heard of it? So it's the stage of sleep in which you most often remember your dreams. You can actually dream in the other stages of sleep, but when they've woken people up from rapid eye movement sleep and then non-rapid eye movement sleep, they find that you remember your dreams more often from rapid eye movement sleep. And so that's why... Um, it's, that's why um, it's known as dream sleep. So what happens as you go through the night is that each of the stages of sleep gets a little bit lighter and the rapid eye movement sleep gets longer. So if I wake somebody up, it's really hard at the beginning of the night to wake people up. But if you do, they'll be really kind of like, it takes them a little while to come round and they're really groggy. Whereas if you wake somebody up at the end of the night when they've gone through all their cycles of sleep, they should feel relatively more refreshed and they'll often remember their dreams. So we fall asleep within five or 10 minutes. We have 90 minute cycles. We have periods of REM sleep and that's the standard. But there's lots of things that can alter your sleep. So not everybody sleeps in the same way. And one of the reasons why people come to sleep lectures is because they always have sleep that's a little bit different, and then they've come to find out why they don't sleep the same as other people. So if you want to ask me anything about your sleep, I'm really happy to answer it. These are what the brain waves look like for each of those stages of sleep. So while you're listening to me and you're really attentive, all your neurons are firing randomly, and the amount of activity that I will pick up on the surface of your scalp is very fast frequency, low voltage activity. Lots of fast frequency activity going on, unless you're on the back row, and then you start to do that thing where you're sort of drifting like this. So that stage of sleep is what we call stage one, stage two sleep. We have these artificial stages, but in actual fact, it's just almost a continuum. 
And I think this is what I call, this bit I call tube sleep. Best sleep laboratory in the world is the London tube system. You can see people going to sleep. So as you fall asleep, you lose your postural muscle activity. So have you seen people doing this? And their head starts to go like this. And then what happens is you lose your ocular muscle activity as well. So your eyes sort of roll up like this and you're sort of doing this. But in the light stages of sleep, you can still hear. So when you come round and you get to South Kensington and you're doing this and it goes South Kensington, you're like this, you get off the tube. When you get down into deep sleep, what's happening is that the neurons in your brain start to fire in unison. And what you get when you measure the surface activity is very um, uh, slow frequency, high voltage activity as the neurons fire in unison. And so this is the deep sleep and that's the one where you're on the circle line, you're sort of slightly dribbling and you're not going to wake up. You're just going to keep going around the circle line. This one, it's very hard to wake you up from. And then there's this REM sleep down at the bottom. And those of you that are looking at it in a certain way will realize that the REM sleep looks very like the light sleep. So that's quite interesting because you're now in quite an unresponsive state in REM sleep. Your brain looks like it's awake. And REM sleep is amazing. I don't think we really know too much about what it is and why it is the way it is, but it is the most fascinating state because your brain is almost completely active. Of course, your body is functionally paralyzed to stop you presumably acting out any of your dreams. You're not actually paralyzed, but you are functionally paralyzed, so you don't um, move. You might twitch a little bit, but you don't move very much. So that's kind of the standard about how we talk about sleep and how we think about it. And then there are people who do basic research, usually on animals, looking at the mechanisms of what controls sleep. So we do know some of the centers um, that actually control the sleep. And we know some of the fiber pathways that control the sleep. And really, the purpose of giving you all these neurotransmitters here is to make you realize how complicated it is. So you sort of have this idea that your brain is just switching off when it's going to sleep. But actually, it's quite an active process putting you to sleep. And it requires a switch in a lot of these neurotransmitters. So we know that some of the neurotransmitters are upregulated, some of them are downregulated, and we know that we can manipulate them. So caffeine will affect some of these um, neurotransmitters so that you can actually stimulate yourself to stay awake for longer, etc. Some of you will have taken antihistamines, and you'll see here right at the top that histamine activates the cortex in wakefulness. So, of course, if you start taking antihistamines, then you're going to make yourself feel drowsy. And a lot of the drugs that we use medically, things like beta blockers, um, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are used in depression, those drugs quite a lot of the time will influence um, the sleep itself. So the ability to understand sleep and the neurotransmitters is not just about understanding sleep because it's kind of interesting. It's also about understanding the interaction with some of the other medical processes that go on. So that's the process of putting you to sleep. And then we have to think about, well, if I'm measuring somebody's sleep, um, how does um, their general physiology affect their sleep? So your sleep changes as you get older. So who's got sort of younger brothers, sisters, children, little babes around? Anybody seen little children sleep? If you see a little child asleep, it's really hard to wake. Once they're asleep, they're really hard to wake up because little children either sleep in deep sleep or REM sleep. They don't have anything in between. So they're either awake, deep sleep, or REM sleep. And they have much more REM sleep than we do. So one of the things that's been put forward is the idea that REM sleep is associated with learning and memory because you have much more REM sleep when you're younger. 
And then I'm afraid once you get past your mid-twenties, it's all downhill, especially when we're talking about sleep patterns. So this is a sleep pattern, the amount of deep sleep occurring in a younger person between 20 and 26. You've got these nice cycles, four 90-minute cycles of deep sleep, much more deep sleep at the beginning of the night than at the end of the night, with more REM sleep at the end of the night. But as you get older, you've got much less deep sleep. The other thing that happens as you get older is your sleep becomes more fragmented. So these are the aging years. So this is 60, 70 year old up here. And they're waking up about 25 times an hour. You wake up probably about 10 times an hour. But you only wake up really, really briefly and then you just turn over or move a bit and then you go back to sleep. But your sleep is much more active than you probably think about. You don't remember those little brief arousals because it takes you about a minute plus through your brain, your cortex, to wake up. That's how you can kind of wake up and turn your alarm clock off and then go back to sleep and not know you've done it. Of course, knowing that you can do that doesn't excuse you from not turning up whatever you were you were supposed to be doing at that point. So sleep is heavily influenced by age. It's also, influ it's also different in males and females, and particularly for females when they go through different parts of the menstrual cycle and when they go through the menopause, vastly affected by, um, uh, uh, by the um, hormones. So lots of changes associated with um, males and females. Obviously, sleep deprivation will influence your sleep. So if you throw an all-nighter and you decide not to sleep, what will happen the next night is that you will, your brain will go for the deep sleep first. So it will sacrifice the REM sleep to give you your deep sleep. And then the following night after that, you'll have a REM sleep, what they call a REM sleep rebound, as it catches up on the REM sleep. So your brain knows how to recalibrate itself. And what tends to happen is that your brain kind of gets itself ready to go to sleep. And so if you sleep on a regular cycle, like you always go to bed at the same time and always get up at the same time, then your sleep is more likely to be regular and consolidated than if you start going to bed later and earlier, which is what most of us do because we've got access to electric lights and um, information whenever we want it on our laptops and things. So... Um, Routine and sleep deprivation influence sleep. Caffeine is the most universal drug for influencing sleep, but there are other drugs that alcohol influences sleep, and a lot of drugs, as I've said, um, SSIs um, and, and a lot of the cardiac drugs influence sleep. And then we've got specific disorders that occur during sleep. So the one that quite, who, who's heard of narcolepsy? Okay, so narcolepsy is the one that really does influence the sleep. So what narcolepsy does is it's a dissociation between the atonia, the, the lack of neural muscle activity during REM, and the sleepiness. So what happens is that you get the functional paralysis of REM sleep occurring during wakefulness. So you get... Um, people just fall into the floor, typically in emotional states when they're angry or happy. They'll just fall to the floor and have the atonia of REM. And then they also have very difficulty controlling their sleep as well. So they'll have bouts of sleep and feeling very sleepy. Really difficult disease, um, uh, narcolepsy, and also quite difficult to diagnose because it doesn't always present in the same way. Jet lag, that's the one that we usually do to ourselves because your body's preparing to go to sleep and then you decide to change time zones. You can talk about jet lag if you'd like to. Sleep terrors, sleep talking and sleep walking are what they call parasomnias. They're things that happen while you're asleep. Most of them we are um, supposed to grow out of. So sleep walking, um, sleep talking, enuresis. Anybody know what enuresis is? Bedwetting. Always good to have a nice technical name for it, isn't it? So enuresis is bedwetting. Bruxism, grinding your teeth. Some people grind their teeth at night, really can make a huge difference to your 
um, teeth because your um, jaw muscles are so strong, can really grind your teeth down. So these are, by and large, things that happen during sleep. They're called parasomnias. Sometimes they can be very difficult to treat. And often, if they extend into adulthood, they can be very difficult. Um, I once worked with a journalist who allows me to tell his story, but he worked in a war zone, and he used to sleepwalk. Not a good idea if you're in a war zone to walk out on the balcony. He just kept getting shot at because he was on, in this war zone. A real, really big problem for him, and he tried everything to stop it. Um, REM behavior disorder is actually a, um, occurs often in um, older men, and it's a problem with the REM sleep itself. And interestingly enough, now they're starting to link REM behavior disorder to Parkinson's disease. So what something people are now starting to think that sleep disorders are actually precursors to some other diseases. So lots of sleep um, disorders, and the one that I'll talk to you a bit more about at the end of the lecture is sleep apnea, which is difficulty in breathing while you're asleep and is relatively common, affecting, by the time you get older, probably about a third of older people. Okay, so why do we sleep? Why, if you do all those horrible things while you're asleep, would you actually put yourself through it? Um, and we have some theories now. We used to say we don't really know, but I think we do have some theories. What is quite interesting is that almost every mammal, interest, insect, everything that's ever been studied seems to have a period of quiescence. Although how you know your fruit flies asleep is actually going to be the topic of one of the um, lectures that I know that um, you're going to have. And I would definitely come because it's absolutely amazing how you measure a fruit fly's sleep. Really, really amazing. They've spent a long time quantifying fruit flies' sleep because then they can study the genetics of sleep, which is great. So my favorite two um, mammals are dolphins. Why have I got a picture of a dolphin up? Anybody know what's special about dolphin sleep? Yeah, they only sleep with half their brain at a time. So you sleep with both your cortex going to sleep at the same time. But dolphins only sleep with half their brain, and then the other half of the brain stays awake, presumably because they're air breathers, and they have to um, keep coming up for air. Birds do it quite a lot as well, presumably so they don't fall off the telegraph wires or something like that while they're asleep. But what's interesting about dolphins, I've never really found out is whether when they're in REM sleep, they sort of swim around in a circle because presumably only one flipper works. So there are some interesting things we don't really know. What about the echidna or the spiny anteater? The reason um, he or she is up there is because they occupy a really interesting niche in evolution because they're mammals, but they lay eggs. So they're in this nice, funky um, orange bit here. And that makes them really important from an evolutionary perspective because if they have REM sleep or don't have REM sleep, you can argue about which one is important or not. And for a long time, people didn't think that the echidna had any REM sleep. So the echidnas didn't dream. But now they've actually decided that echidnas do have REM sleep, which means that they can't say that non-REM sleep evolved before REM sleep. So we're still now in the position where we don't know which one evolved first. Um, but that's one of the reasons why people study the different kinds of mammals, so that they can come up with theories about how sleep evolved. And people have tried to look at the average length of sleep to also answer the question about why do we sleep? If you're bigger, do you need more sleep than if you're little? Well, that doesn't really work because apparently giraffes don't sleep very much at all. And there are some great YouTube videos of giraffes asleep and you can watch their necks go like this. Very good. Um, and, you know, anybody who's watched those wildlife programs, lions just lay around sleeping most of the time. But it doesn't really seem to follow that the little animals sleep more than the um, bigger animals. 
And some people then talked about brain weight and whether if your brain weighs more, you have to sleep more than other animals. And that doesn't really work either if you're trying to look about the evolution of sleep. Mammals are one of the few, um, sorry, humans are one of the few mammals that sleep in one consolidated block all night. Most other animals sleep in smaller blocks, presumably because evolutionary, that means they don't get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or something. And so because we have nice, warm, comfy beds that are safe, we sleep for longer periods, presumably. OK, so this is your chance to turn to your person next to you and tell them how long you sleep for. So the Royal Society of Public Health came up with what is your slumber number? So how long do you normally sleep for? Okay, so we're going to do a little straw poll here for those of you that feel brave. Who sleeps less than five hours a night? I'm just prepared to admit it. Okay, five to seven. Seven to nine. Above nine. Okay, I'm, I'm actually impressed. I think you might be slightly better than the first year medical student. So these are the numbers of how long typically the um, Royal Society of Public Health thinks you should be sleeping. So assuming that you're in the audience somewhere in this rail, role here, you're somewhere between seven and nine hours. And the difficulty when people say to me, how much should I sleep? is really it depends on you know what makes you feel better and as with most things in biology there's a normal distribution so some of you will not need as much sleep as other people and the test is usually do you sleep in at the weekend if you have the opportunity assuming you don't have children or other things that you should be doing at the weekend so think about whether you actually do catch up sleep at the weekend and if you're doing, going in for quite a lot of catch-up sleep at the weekend, which is not just recreational, then you should probably sleep a bit more during the week. And it's really, you know, this is the bit where it goes from being quite interesting and fun to actually realizing how important sleep is for your body function. And what is important to understand is that if you do not sleep, you will die. So sleep is used in really unfortunate situations as a torture because when you get past a certain point, the drive to sleep becomes so great that you will just sleep while you're standing up. You know, and you'll sleep while you're in the middle of doing things. So I handed you out, or actually Tanzin handed you out a questionnaire about how often you are likely to fall asleep in certain situations. And one of the questions says, talking to somebody, doesn't it? And I used to think, oh, you would never fall asleep while you're talking to somebody. But when I was doing night duties a lot, I got to the point where I was, those of you that are doing research and PhDs will understand this. I had both my supervisors in front of me and I was explaining my data to them. And I fell asleep in the middle of the conversation. I just went, because I'd been working nights. That was my excuse. So you can fall asleep while you're talking to people if you're really sleepy. But what if you collect the symptoms together, you'll really find is that those of you that have been in situations where you've been sleep deprived, first of all, you get mood changes. We call it the tired and emotional syndrome in the lab. You get, you know, all of a sudden you just get very tired. And um, it definitely, in the majority of people, affects their memory. Long-term sleep deprivation can affect immune system. In certain situations, if you get a lot of chronic sleep deprivation, it can affect things like growth hormone. And 
There's also a situation where you get a lot of metabolic and um, uh, thermodynamic changes. So, for example, in REM sleep, your Paul Keeler cabinet, you do not control your body temperature. So it's quite interesting the different ways in which sleep influences your other physiological functions. And people have got really interested in that now. And there's a project going on in Oxford at the moment looking at teenagers and sleeping and whether schools should actually start later because of the need for teenagers who absolutely need at least an hour plus sleep biologically more than we do, as well as the fact that emotionally they might like to stay in bed for longer. So if we break those general symptoms down, the first thing that you can say is if you go in for acute short-term sleep deprivation, you're going to get hyperfrontal type syndromes, which comes around to things like you get very fixed thinking. So you, your thinking is much less flexible. And um, your, your sense of humor definitely changes. You have a sense of risk where you probably have poor judgment, but you also have a very negative mindset. So you get this fixed negative mindset. Um, they say that you have reduced emotional intelligence, but I think that basically just means you get into arguments more often, or you're kind of not able to think a little bit more. And if you think about this, it's really not the state in which you can learn well. And it's certainly not the state in which you should be trying to sit important events like exams. And yet all of us, when we're running up to big events, usually the first thing we do is cut our sleep. We don't cut how much we drink or how much we eat or whatever. We just seem to cut our sleep because it's seen as a sort of optional extra. So if you take nothing away from this lecture, take away that your sleep is really, really vitally important for your health. And if you go in for a more long-term sleep deprivation, then that's where the metabolic changes start to occur. First thing that happens when you um, get sleep deprived is you start eating much more salt and sugar. And some of the interesting work that's been done on the relationship between insulin resistance and glucose breakdown shows that actually sleep deprivation has quite a profound impact on your ability to control your blood sugars, which I think is very important. And the other thing that's quite interesting and relevant to some of the research that goes on at Imperial, we have a fantastic metabolic department that have done loads of work on things like leptin and ghrelin, which are your appetite hormones. And they appetite centers and the hormones that we're talking about are really close to the sleep center. And I think it's probably highly likely that they're sharing different neurotransmitters. So the link between sleep deprivation and appetite is really probably quite close. Definitely links between infection and immune responses and sleep deprivation. And then the one that everybody's talking about at the moment is neurotoxicity. So if you decide that you don't want to do medicine, for those of you that are doing medicine, one of the areas that you could get into is you could be a sleep coach for some of the top sports teams. And most of the top sports teams do, in fact, have sleep coaches, including things like the sailing. And, you know, if you do swimming, you've got to get up early and train and things. So there's actually quite a big um, push to be interested in sleep now in elite athletes. But this is um, the real work that's causing all the interest in sleep. This is a theory that came out a few years ago. And essentially, what this theory, which is um, called the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, says is that while you're sitting there listening to me, you're creating neural connections. So you create lots of synapses, connections between your neurons. And those are quite heavy on using up um, uh, the resources of your brain. So they use up a lot of glucose to create them. But you, you make lots of connections while you're awake. And then the theory goes something like this. If you carried on making lots of connections, your brain would fill up with connections and there'd be no room for new connections. So at some point, you must be breaking down some of those connections. So one of the theories around sleep is it's the period of time 
where you, you just get rid of all the connection, neural connections that you don't need. So it's the time when your brain throws away the information that it doesn't need. And so, bless the Americans, they call it taking out the trash. And this science paper has actually got this phrase, taking out the trash, in it. So during the day, you build up synaptic potentials, and during the night, you get rid of them. And this um, group in Wisconsin, in America, Tononi and Sorelli, have put together this theory, and then they had to go and collect some evidence to say that their theory was correct. And so they started making these beautiful images of neurons and trying to look at slow wave sleep and enriched wakefulness and sleep to look at the amount of neural connections that were occurring when they um, did these measurements. These measurements that were published in this science paper a couple of years ago took about five people three years working full time because they were doing all these brain slices to look at all these neural connections. Which is probably why it's so difficult to do sleep research, but it's amazing research. And um, they really believe this theory. OK, the other reason why sleep's become really important, who's heard of something called glymphatics? All over the news at the moment. The lymphatics are the way in which your body drains fluid from um, the various interstitial spaces. The glymphatics is the way your brain does it. So it's the ability of your brain um, to basically control the fluid within it. And one of the reasons why it's become quite uh, an interesting and hot area in sleep is because they think that a lot of the interstitial drainage that occurs seems to be during sleep. So they think that the brain during sleep is again auto-regulating itself. And the reason it's become really hot is because those of you that know anything about aging will see that when you start to talk about beta amyloid clearance, you start to talk about accelerated cognitive decline and a very emotive disease called dementia. So people have started to link these things together, sometimes putting quite large bridges between pieces of information to link them together. And they've started to look at the glymphatic pathways and how they go wrong. And this very recent Lancet Neurology paper talks about that. And there's some amazing work that was done in California by um, Matthew Walker's group that started to look at, if you're older and you have sleep problems, does that mean you've got accelerated cognitive decline because you're not sleeping properly? And for some of you, you might recognize this book, which he published around Christmas, which is um, like a, a popular way of describing some of his theories. And so he was promoting his book over the holidays, and it's actually got quite a lot of really good neuroscience in it if you want to have a look at it. But it essentially talks about whether aging can cause, the sleep deprivation associated with aging can accelerate cognitive decline. And people have started to really latch onto this, and um, it's driving a lot of research in sleep at the moment, because one of the things, if you want to research something, You've got to have a detrimental consequence to it in order to get the money to kind of do that research. And so people are really starting to now think about sleep research. And the reason that it's important to me is because I work with people who have difficulty breathing at night. And if you have difficulty breathing at night, how you get to breathe better is you wake up. So that means that my patients don't sleep very well. So instead of having this nice structure of the 90-minute sleep cycle, my patients don't have any deep sleep and they wake up a lot. And as you get older, your airway becomes, your airways become more floppy, all your muscles get less strong as you get older. So more older people have difficulty breathing. So we've been thinking about whether that could be accelerating the cognitive decline. And because my patients have difficulty in breathing, the other thing that happens is they fall asleep, 
they get a reduced muscle tone and they don't breathe very well, but they also get low oxygen because they're not breathing. So now the brain of these people is not getting any restorative sleep and it's getting a lot of low oxygen, which is kind of not really a good place to have a brain. So we've been looking at brains of older people to see whether they have any problems in them. And in particular, we've been looking at the hippocampal area, which is an area of the brain over here, which is very sensitive to low oxygen. And what we found in summary is that some areas seem to be upregulated and other areas seem to be downregulated. And it's really hard to tell who in who is doing what. And part of the reason why it's hard to tell is these structures that we're looking at are tiny and the resolution of the magnetic resonance imaging scans is not that good. So we're all the time pushing the technology to allow us to answer the questions that we want to answer. And while you're doing your research, those of you who are in the audience who are a bit younger than me, I think the changes in MR technology will make a huge difference to brain research. And again, one of the um, lectures that you're going to be given during the next week or so is from somebody called Marco at, um, uh, at the Hammersmith who's doing a lot of this research. But you can put together ideas where you've got low oxygen and sleepiness associated with problems with breathing. You can go through the different cycles of how that might influence your sleep. And you can come out at the other end with a hypothesis about how it might be detrimental. But unless you can measure it and collect the evidence and do good quality research, it will only ever be a theory. So we've gone to trying to use animal models to try and prove it, because sometimes it's easier to do the research in animals, because you can induce the hypoxia to try and see what happens. So we've done some animal work to try and make it work. The other thing that we've done is we've said, well, if we get rid of the low oxygen, does it make people better? So this is a trial that we did in patients where we actually got them to breathe better and looked at how sleepy they were. So here are the people who were treated with the yellow dots at baseline, and then they got less sleepy when we treated them at three months and one year. And the control people got less sleepy, but not as less sleepy. This was a network of 14 labs around the UK. The study cost well over a million pounds. And it probably will never be repeated, because it will be unethical now to deprive people of treatment when we know that it makes a difference. So it's very difficult sometimes to do the studies you want to do when we know that there are treatments that help people breathe and can make their sleep better. What, of course, we don't know is the mechanism of how that happened. So the whole reason why we're all here and we're interested in sleep is because if you don't sleep, it makes you feel sleepy and it makes you feel rubbish. And lots of people, if they can't sleep, will come and tell their work colleagues or their friends or their loved ones in the morning that they've had difficulty in sleeping. It actually costs the government a lot because um, it's one of the biggest reasons for road traffic accidents. And when you look at the economic cost of sleep, this down here is a RAND analysis, which is a group that do a lot of work on economics. And they did a, published a report a few years ago looking at the economic cost of not sleeping. Look over here in Japan. They don't do much sleep at all. Massive cost of not sleeping. Also in the US and the good old United Kingdom. So we came out as one of the most sleep deprived and highest GDP costs of um, any of the countries that they looked at. So we really need to find a way to get people to sleep more and sleep better. And I think we could do that if we could measure sleep better and describe sleep better. So some of you that came in earlier, I gave you our best measure for sleepiness. It's called the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. And Epworth is a place in Australia where this questionnaire 
was developed. And it asks you the likelihood of falling asleep in different situations. And for those of you that have done it, you can add up your score and it will be anywhere between 0 and 24. If you're over, I'm going to say 14, you should come and see me. Anything over 11 is considered sleepy. And once you get past 16, 14, 16, you should be thinking about possibly some lifestyle changes or coming to see me. Because that level of sleepiness is going to be influencing your daytime activities. But the problem when we um, talk to patients about sleepiness is everybody uses different words. So what word would you use if you came in in the morning and said you were tired? Would you use the word tired, sleepy, fatigued, knackered? We don't. We, we have some words, but we don't have that many words. And I think most people agree that tiredness is kind of like a chronic, uh, and then fatigue is something a bit different, isn't it? But none of it is very clear. And I can't come to you and take a blood test from you and measure your level of sleepiness or do a something like a blood pressure measurement and get your level of fatigue. And I guarantee if I could do that, we would have a better way of managing our physiology because if we had, uh, what I say is, if we had a breathalyzer test for sleepiness, you wouldn't drive while you were sleepy. But because we can't take blood levels of sleepiness, then people get away with what they're doing because we can only subjectively measure how you feel. And subjective means that you're describing how you feel. Objective means I measure it with a number. And because you're describing how you feel, it's quite difficult to then keep describing it the same way day in, day out when different things are happening to you. So one of the things that we've been trying to do, I think this might be almost my last slide, is we've been working with the engineering department here to try and find better ways of measuring brain activity. So this is an electrode that is sewed into one of those squidgy ear plugs. And you put it in your ear, and it measures your brain activity. And it's really, it sounds easy, but it's really difficult because the um, bone around your ear is really thick. So it's actually a tiny signal that you get out of it. But this picture here is to show that they're about the same. And so you replace all this equipment that this dapper young man's wearing, and you put it all in this earplug, and then you put it in your ear, and that's it. And the idea is you could walk around with the earplug in for several days, and I could get a continuous measure of your sleep. Except it's not quite that easy, because we'd have to find a way of powering it, so you have to think about the battery power of the amplifiers and all of that. But that's what we have been looking at with Daniello's group in the signal processing. Now, you could argue, some of you, that you've already got that mechanism, because who's got a Fitbit that measures their sleep? Or a phone that gives you a sleep measure? Yeah, how's it doing that? How does it do it? And most of all, I want to know, how does it measure REM sleep? So, pardon? Well, I think some of it might be a microphone also. I mean, most of them are accelerometers, so they're measuring whether you're moving about or not. So the implication is, if you're not moving about, you're asleep. But they, my point is that they're indirect measures. They don't actually measure neural activity. They measure something else, either microphone or they're measuring accelerometry. But somehow, because it's a number on the phone, the number of people that show me, highly intelligent people at Imperial College that show me the numbers very proudly because it's been measured. So I think it's interesting that if we can find a measure, a way of measuring sleep, 
I think we will be able to really advance our research. And a lot of what some of the people have been taught, are going to talk to you about over the next um, uh, few lectures or few sessions is they'll talk about how they've tried to measure sleep. So I think what we've learned today is that sleep is an active process, definitely an active process. It's controlled by multiple neurons and transmitters. It's complex, and you need to look after it. If you sleep deprive yourself, you'll get changes in diet, you'll get changes in the immune system, but most of all, you'll get changes in your brain. So you'll get changes in your emotion and your memory and your memory recall. So if you're studying, I would recommend that you look after your sleep as well. And for me, um, the future is all about improving the technology and getting some of these people who are our medical students doing sleep projects to actually start thinking about how we can do new things with sleep. Because you're the people who are going to find the new stuff. I'm done. I've, I've done a lot of my research. You're going to find the new stuff and make all the new ideas and breakthroughs. So these are some of the people that have done the work that I was talking about. Most of all, thank you very much to you guys for listening. And if you've enjoyed hearing about sleep, do come along to some of the other events that this team have fantastically put together. This guy is amazing. These two guys are amazing. I mean, they're all amazing. This guy's just come from Cambridge, got nature paper. And this guy is the best lecturer I've heard for a long time. He's the fruit fly guy. So come along, because we've got the best of the best from Imperial, but also we thought we'd you know, invite the dark side from UCL. We've got the chaps from Oxford. So really great activity program. Thank you very much for your attention, everybody. You're welcome to ask any questions. So uh, this is a small token of uh, appreciation. It's not just that there's a Thank a you. Good insight. Thank you very um, much. If, is there any question? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask the first question. So um, a lot of people talk about this uh, poly, polygraphic sleep. So um, people sleep for an hour and then wake up and then work for about three hours and then go sleep. Surely again. not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, what, what are your opinions? So if you sleep, when, you, when you're controlling your sleep, if you only sleep for about an hour, you won't be getting right down. You'll get a bit of deep sleep, but not that much. So um, when people are trying to stay awake, one of the things that they recommend is that you, take, you drink two cups of really strong coffee, and then you sleep for about 20 minutes. And then by the time you wake up, you will, the caffeine will have kicked in and you won't be right down in deep sleep, so you won't be too groggy. So if you're trying to keep yourself awake, that's what people recommend. And what I wouldn't recommend is you keep doing it if you're driving a long way, but it usually gets you to the next junction, let's say. For trying to maintain a kind of power lifestyle, then having short periods of sleep and then um, being awake it's probably okay for a reasonable period of time. But what will then happen is you'll just get used to having fragmented sleep and it will make it quite difficult for you to sleep in longer periods. Those people that have had children often describe that it's quite difficult to consolidate their sleep afterwards. Um, it works for a short period of time because sleep is also, and sleepiness is very influenced by motivation. So most people that are doing those power nap kind of lifestyles are doing it because they've got to get through a short-term period of high volume work. So you can do it for a short period of time, but don't take it as a lifestyle choice, I think. Thank you very much. There's a question over there. Uh, yeah, what about five days of sleep time? So five days of like two solid sleep times per day. So there was a paper in the New England Journal a few years, well, actually quite a few years ago now, that said that if you have a siesta, you live longer. So they took loads and loads of data and they looked at cardiovascular disease and they said the incidence of cardiovascular disease is lower if you have a siesta. My view would be if you have a lifestyle that allows you to have a siesta, <laughs> you might feel better and have less stress. But in theory, they controlled for that. And their view was that it was a healthier way 
to have that biphasic or to sleep in two chunks. If you leave humans to free run, if you, don't, if you give them no light, dark cues, we do separate our sleep into a first period of sleep um, uh, and then we'll wake up so early evening, then we'll wake up and then we sleep late. So we do actually sleep biphasic naturally. And when you're on the Antarctic base, they sleep bi biphasic. They've done ones where they impose sleep regulation and things. So you're probably fine if you're in that siesta mode. The stress comes when you live in a society that's not set up for the type of sleep that you want to do. So if you're somebody who sleeps very late in the morning and then works in the evening and everybody's telling you you've got to get to work, then that's where the stress comes in. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, okay. for, for Thank you very much. If anybody's got any questions they don't want to shout out, I'm happy to wait at the front for them. Thank you.